I have a question. If seeing is believing, does it matter what we see? And I ask this question because I see a pattern. I look at the images that surrounded my own life as I've grown up, and I look at others in my generation, and I look at others in following generations, and wonder if the images that surrounded their growing up impacted their later lives. And I ask it especially in the context of my experience in visual effects, in animation, in entertainment, where we can create just about anything, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to tell the difference between fact and fiction. So this is where it, it began for me. Uh, in the Gramercy Theater down on 23rd Street in New York. It was just down the street from where I lived, and I could walk into a darkened room and be transported all over the world. And not too far away was the United Nations building, which introduced me to people from around the world. And uh, the 1964 World's Fair, which celebrated cultures and people from every corner of the globe. And then, in that Gramercy Theater, I saw The Red Balloon, a movie made without a word of dialogue that won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. But it introduced me to France, a place where I feel very comfortable today. And it also introduced me to the impact and power of movies to move people. I grew up on the wonderful world of Disney, which taught me about wonder and imagination, and the Ed Sullivan Show, which taught me that there were people with talent all over the world. The Civil Rights Movement taught me about justice and fairness and humanity, and I learned that it was okay to speak up and speak out if we disagreed. And I also learned that anything is possible. So, is it any wonder that at this period of time, that out of this period of time, some of the icons of the digital revolution emerged? Now, this is 1974, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, shot done by Doug Trumbull. And at the time, this was the state of the art in visual effects. Visual effects were, this was a brilliant, rare, and extremely expensive shot. Just a couple of years ago, Neil Blumenkamp directed the lower budget District 9 and achieved this. Now, visual effects are based on the principles of illusion. Assumption, presumption, and context and reality. Things are what we think they are, that they behave as we expect them to, and that they are operating within the world we've created. Of course, in movies, we can create just about any world. The trick is that illusions must be maintained. So the line between reality and what we actually believe is now virtually obliterated. So I actually wonder what this is doing to our perception of reality. I was researching this talk and I came across this news story. And you can kind of imagine my surprise, it sure looks real, but I didn't know that historians invented the ancient Greeks. Well, of course, that's satire from Facebook or from uh, The Onion, but that doesn't negate the need now for Facebook to begin tagging fake news stories. This is a shot of the United States Congress in joint session. A lot of people suggest that the difference between Hollywood and Washington, D.C., the U.S. Capitol, is that people in Hollywood look better. Right. What's really happened is we have gone from iconic statesman to an iconic statesman. <laughs> and this is what people begin to think politicians are really like. Did you think I'd forgotten you? Perhaps you hoped I had. 
Don't waste a breath mourning Miss Barnes. Every kitten grows up to be a cat. They seem so harmless at first, small, quiet, lapping up their saucer of milk. But once their claws get long enough, they draw blood, sometimes from the hand that feeds them. For those of us climbing to the top of the food chain, there can be no mercy. There is but one rule, hunt or be hunted. Welcome back. Now, one of the reasons that we believe that performance is that Kevin Spacey and the entire team behind that carefully researched the ambiance, the atmosphere, the details, and there is enough reality within the context of the fiction to make it plausible. And what we've seen in the news suggests that, well, maybe there is some truth to it. And that is something that often is missing from political advertising. Because in the United States, where there are truth in advertising laws for consumer products, no such guidelines exist. There's a group trying to take care of some of that. Which, if we can hear the audio, Nothing, you know, we really have to worry about. I mean, there's so much information out there, it doesn't matter if something's true or not. You know, you're just trying to sell just like really the cool. candidate, yeah. So, this is what the nightly news looked like in 1964. Three networks that took great pride in their international news gathering organizations. They presented the news each night, and gave some context and perspective to it. So much so that Walter Cronkite, the CBS anchor, was often referred to as the most trusted man in America, signing off each night with the signature, and that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. Today, we have a 24-7 news cycle characterized by MSNBC presenting a left-leaning liberal view, CNN taking a moderate middle-of-the-road position, and Fox News representing the right. And apparently, with the State of the Union address, it depends on which network you watch as to how the news is reported. And part of that is because it is the news business. If you look at ratings, the number of viewers watching news is going down, but the economics are very high for Fox, which continues to go because they have their viewers enjoy the way they deliver the news. Now, 64, whoops, 64, got to go back. 64, that's the average age of a television news viewer. And over at Fox, it's 68. So we're in the midst of a cycle, but it looks like it won't last forever. Now, <laughs> motion pictures really are emotion pictures. Back in that theater, I recognized that movies had this extraordinary power to actually generate an emotion in the audience. The earliest movies were really focused on people and uh, places and really no reading was required. And that was important because newspapers at that time were all text and fine print. The U.S. president at that time, Woodrow Wilson, recognized that movies were a universal language that it lends itself importantly to the presentation of America's plans and purpose. Now, some would call that propaganda, and most propaganda films at the time were more directed at internal populations, really as a motivating force. There is a darkening of propaganda today, as we saw last summer with the ISIS videos. And what is particularly troubling is that they are building on characteristics of modern filmmaking, multi-camera shoots, production design, and scripting, and uh, a very cunning uh, use of, of uh, social media. So why does it work? Because it's a visual shorthand that transcends language and literacy. Now, there's a reason for that, and that's that time and understanding uh, are compacted with, with imagery. 
13 milliseconds is what it takes us to be able to recognize an object, but to process a word, to really understand it, can take a multiple, an exponential multiple of that. So what we were moving at is culture at the speed of light. And the 20th century expanded, especially after World War II. And a lot of what we saw were romanticized versions of, uh, of, of people, we used to call movie makers tourists with big cameras. And we began to see uh, other cultures, other styles, and social and, and uh, political thrillers like Costa Garza Z and a separation, which introduced us to a, a, a side of Iran that we have not seen. But in the 21st century, we really have a revolution. The internet changes everything, said Jeff Cole at the Center for the Digital Future. And what's happening is that it is the greatest advance really surpassing television, but as its value as a source of entertainment and news increases, our trust in it is going down. Now, Martha Bales wrote a book through a screen darkly, and what she talks about in there is that a lot of our images of, other, of, of America are clouded by the images projected through media. Now, it used to be diplomatic channels and everything else. They'd help filter the impression that we made. But with the internet, that is not happening. There's a lot more open media, which is a good thing, but the opportunity to manage that image is becoming increasingly difficult. Now, blockbusters are made for broad audiences, and because of that, they have a tendency to self-regulate themselves. And for the more extreme films, we look at them as a real funhouse mirror, and our knowledge of our culture allows us to correct that. But if the image is not as well known in different countries, the perception of what we are is different from the people who we really are. What is seen then is vulgarity, vitriol, and violence, and that is an impression that a lot of people have. The gap between our ability to separate fact from fiction uh, is, is, is widening as the fact and fiction itself are almost exchanging places. So it creates this. There was an official at the U.S. Department of State back in the late 80s who suggested that if we're questioning our morals at home in our media, imagine what's happening overseas without that corrective filter. And certainly, we're seeing that. So we've never been more connected, perhaps, but yet we are often even more apart. Now, crowds do have their place, but a crowd itself is not always wise. And part of that is that there are some requirements to that, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that on nuanced ideas, you need a little more refined thinking. The other challenge that we have today is algorithms do have consequences. When we extract information from people, we're not giving them all of the necessary tools they really need to process complex issues and ideas because it is expert expertise and diversity that are really the cornerstones of good decision-making. A variety of opinions and points of view combined with expertise, and then a better decision can be made. So personally, I like my water filter, my information a little less so. So where are we? Well, we're here, 
And we are at the rise of a new generation, Generation Z. I believe Generation Z is just behind and definitely younger than just about all of us, but there is a tremendous hope in this generation, and we have seen early indication of it in the current generation of millennials, a much more open and tolerant cohort. Generation Z is a generation born of a really chaotic socioeconomic time, a very complex time, uncertainty prevailed, and more than our share of volatility. So what that's done is it's created a rising generation that is much more social and global in their, over their, their view, and they also are a group of do-gooders. They actually passionately care about making a difference because what they realize is that the institutions are not going to do it for them. They need to be active, active participants. So there are a few characteristics of this cohort, and these are, this is some data prepared by a marketing firm, uh, Sparks and Honey, uh, in a little graphic done by Marketo. But the reality of this group is that they really are visual communicators. Uh, it, it, like snackable content. Uh, and they want it on a diverse, diverse range of multiple screens. They're curious and entrepreneurial, and they want control over their media. They want it their way. Importantly, they want to rally behind social causes, and this may be the most important thing, they are eager to learn, and they desire expertise. Now, expertise is that essential ingredient along with diversity for better decision-making. 2064, 50 years from now, what do you want it to look like? Think about it for a second. We are shaped by what we see. We shape the future by what we show. And it's up to us to do this well. I know we can do it, we will do it, let's do it. Thank you very much.